Jesus says, all who comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. That's beautiful. We will come with a million excuses. But Jesus, do you know me? I will in no wise cast you out. But Jesus, I have sinned. I will in no wise cast you out. But Jesus, I have my doubts. I will in no wise cast you out. But Jesus, I'm going to keep falling. I will in no wise cast you out. That's the gospel. He cleanses the weakest, the vilest, the poor. And that is the light of the gospel that we, as church, in this dark world, get to shine. I want to start by reading a passage, and then we'll pray together. I'm going to read from Matthew 5. It's one of the most popular, I think, the greatest sermon ever written and ever spoken. Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus, the greatest teacher and preacher, standing on a mountain, and he shows us, in a sense, what the church and her people ought to look like, and he begins with the Beatitudes. Um, radical, unbelievable, beautiful blessings, but totally unexpected. And when we begin to live these out, we begin to be salt and light. And that's the passage I want to read, Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Jesus is talking to his disciples. The crowd is listening, and he's saying to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall, it, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole in the to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Again, there we have the vision of God. The glory of God and the mission being a light so that everybody can see the glory of our God we are a light on the hill I think tonight was supposed to be load shedding praise God that we are sitting in the light that we can see each other um, but that's what light does it allows us to really see and he says the city on the hill can't be hidden basically he says can't impossible ever and he says you are a city on a hill now you put Cape Town on top of Table Mountain and you're going to see that city from miles and miles and miles and miles and miles, especially if it's pitch, pitch, pitch dark. Look up into the heavens tonight. You will see stars up there that are billions and billions and trillions of light billions, maybe not trillions of light years. I don't even really know how far the stars are, but billions of light years away. You see that light because it's dark. That's the church in the world. Dark. He says, I'm going to put my light there so that it can shine. So my prayer tonight is that we learn what it means to be a light. Um, last week, we talked about that the whole scriptures, the goal of the whole scriptures is so, so that Jesus might be known to the ends of the earth so that God might be worshipped. Revelation 14 um, where we get to that, every tongue, tribe, nation, and language worshiping God. Tonight, we're going to talk about what that looks like. Um, what does it practically look like for Emmanuel Church? What does it look like for our church? What it looks like for the church in general? So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for the beautiful words that you spoke, and you still speak to us through your word. He that comes to me, I will never cast out. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We pray, change us. Tonight. 
We want to experience your presence. We come here as people that are broken, full of doubt, full of fears, sin haunts us at times. Save us, Lord. Renew us for the sake of your glory. Cause your love to cast out all fear. Cause your love to cast out all doubt. And cause your love to attract us to such a degree that we begin to truly hate and despise and crucify our sins. Father, we pray that you would shape your body in such a way that it would be a light. Also this church, Emmanuel, to the pastors, down to every member, cause this church in this city of Belleville to be a powerful one. Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, um, so tonight, I struggled this week um, because I wanted to limit myself to 10 points. <laughs> um, just 10 aspects of what the contours of a missional church looks like. Now, we could add to this, we could think there's more importance, but what I thought was, what are the most important aspects of a missional church in South Africa? For Emmanuel. Um, now, you can add other aspects if you were in the mission field in Papua New Guinea, or if you were in Canada or the States, it might look a little different. So this is particularly for the church in South Africa. Um, I was trying to think of Emmanuel Church when I wrote this this week. We'll see how well I hit the mark. I don't know you well, so I pray that the Lord allows me um, through His Spirit to reach your hearts. So I'm going to give you ten contours of the missional church. The first one, let's uh, start. The first one is a community that has an apostle-like Holy Spirit in filled enthusiasm for Christ. We have met the risen King. His love and lordship have to send us. His love has to compel us. That's what you get if you meet somebody. Now, I know a lot of people that have met famous people. For some reason, I never run into them, but they come and tell me. It's like, hey, do you know who I saw? I met so-and-so. I met the president. I met this rugby player. I met my greatest hero. And I hear about it all the time. Because they met them. Now what I mean with the Holy Spirit and filled enthusiasm for Christ is that you have truly known Christ. See, the first step in coming to Christ is you seek Christ's face. You seek the face of God. Like the Psalms always say, I seek your face, O oh God. And that means you're turning your back on the vanities of this world. And the more you're facing him, the more you no longer just seek him, but the more you begin to reflect him. You become like a mirror shining his glory to everyone around you. In Acts um, 4, 19, it's, it's beautiful what the, uh, what the apostles say there. Um, Acts 4, 19 and 20, where he says... But Peter and John answered them after they had been called by the Sanhedrin, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Now we know that, but then he says this, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So the most important thing, and I made this point first for a reason, is that Christ dwells in you. The last thing I want for any church is for their evangelism be driven by guilt and shame and fear. What made the disciples so contagious? What makes 
a Christian that you know very well, so contagious? What makes you just love them? It's that they've met Christ personally, individually. He lives in them. And that's what the church wants. How do we do that? We do that in prayer and in his word. Which brings us to the second aspect of a missional church. It's a community that absolutely loves the word. It's a community that believes again in the power of the word of God. That his word is living and active, sharper than two and two-edged sword, dividing to bone and marrow. People are changed by the word of God. And this church should be centered around that word. One of the best ways of doing that is just to memorize it. So that you can begin to give this word to the people. To know what you're talking about. You're not sharing some kind of methodology. You're sharing the Bible. In our house, lunchtime is memorizing time. For an hour. And it's amazing how much you can memorize if you decide to memorize every single day. And then your speech begins to be filled with the word without you even realizing it. <laughs> when you talk, you begin speaking the word of God. And that word is powerful. It is God himself speaking. And it's just basic, especially when you have people asking you questions. When you start with evangelism, you'll have a lot of questions. Now, I try, when I do evangelism, is to refer every question back to some part in the gospel. I like what Billy Graham always used to say. You know, in, in our churches, a lot of times we say the Apostle Paul said this when we preach, and the Apostle Peter says this. Billy Graham always said, the Bible says, in that accent of his. I love that. Well, the Bible says, and he would always go back to the Bible. So if you start memorizing these things, you don't need to carry a Bible around all day. But you can be like, you know what Jesus said? Or, oh yeah, you know that story? It's a perfect parable for this instance. So a contours is an initial church. is one, they have a Holy Spirit, apostle-like passion for Christ. Second, a community that changed that that loves the word. 1 Peter 1 23, you've been born of the imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. <clears throat> now, if you have been born that way, other people are going to be born that way, not by your word, but by the word of God. Um, I love what Rosaria Butterfield says here. She says, we lack biblical fluency. If we lack biblical fluency, we cannot communicate biblical knowledge. We lack biblical fluency, we cannot communicate biblical knowledge. So let's love it. And I mean, not just like read it quick in the morning, like, oh, I gotta do this because I'm a Christian. But let's sit down and meditate on it. And imagine God speaking to you. That's beautiful. Because then you go out and you have a living relationship. All right, one, Holy Spirit filled, apostle like enthusiasm for Christ. The second one, a community that loves the word. As you can see, I'm trying to move a bit quicker than last time, but I'm gonna slow down on a few points that I think are a bit more, yeah, touchy, um, that I really wanna spend time on. I think we can hopefully agree with some of these first points. The third one, um, a community that understands the current culture and times. I think this is important. You'll see in these slides, I have this balance between in the world, yet not of it. Later, we're going to come that the church is a contrast community as well. But a contrast community does not mean an exclusive community. A contrast community does not mean we don't listen to any music that's made by any person, any movie, or we don't know what the culture is all about. Um... We live, what philosophers say, is in a postmodern world. Which means things have changed, in a sense, from where it was maybe 40, 50 years ago. And it used to be that you could go preach, and it would be all about belief, behave, and belonging. 
Why? Because in a modernistic world, it's truth and it's arguments that are going to win the day. It's all about like, is this right or is this wrong? I want to figure it out. Come and I'm going to give you the truth of scripture and then you're going to come to faith. And God works that way sometimes. So then we begin to believe, used to begin to believe, and then we were taught how to behave, like when to sit, when to stand, how to sing. Like every church has its own culture in terms of how it functions as a family, just like every family has its own distinct way of running. Every church is a family of God and has a distinct way of doing things. And then at the end, they would feel home, feel at home. Now in our postmodern culture, it's actually just the other way around. Think about it. People want to belong. Think about how many times community, the word community is used in our culture. It's the Hispanic community in the States, or, or the black community, or the color community, or the white community, or the Dutch community, or the Italian community, or the LGBTQ community. It's all about community. People are looking for a place to belong. They're looking for a place where they feel safe, where they feel at home. And the church should be the ultimate place where a sinner seeking a home finds one. You ever notice how Jesus went about it? He often didn't go with the belief he belonged, all, but he loved them first. And his love led to faith. He opened his doors and by opening and causing those people to belong somewhere, they came to him and they believed in him. So culture is changing. The times we're living in is changing. It's changing more toward a belong. And then they come to faith and then they finally learn what that means for their everyday life. Is there is a place where people feel safe? where anyone can come in. And no one here would be surprised because they know their own heart. Look at, look at them, that's the top gangster. Or prostitute. I'm not surprised. Welcome. Then you know the love of Christ and that love changed you. Um, again, I could go on and on about this. I mean, I hope you guys are reading the news, thinking about how it's interacting. ESCOM is a wonderful way to evangelize, by the way. I love ESCOM. I love them turning on, off the lights. I mean, we get to turn on the lights every time they turn off the lights. It's just like these little things that you can pick up from culture and use what God gives you. Because I believe in the providence of God. I believe ESCOM told me the lights were going to turn off. God knew the lights were going to turn off a billion years ago, and he's using it again for his own glory. So that's the way a Christian gets to live, using every single opportunity, knowing, you know what, I'm going to receive this from God, and I'm going to use it for his glory, and use it to interact with people on an everyday kind of basis. Now, we don't need to be crazy, we don't need to bring the gospel in everywhere, um, but it does change the way that you look at people. And I hope so. I mean, when you're an unbeliever, you see somebody who's sitting on the park bench and you strike up a conversation to them and you're just like, hey, how's it going? And you see him just as another person. Now, when that same person becomes a believer and he sees that person on the park bench, he sees that person differently. As an image bearer of God. As needing him. As made for him. And how he's going to interact is going to be different as the unbeliever. And I hope that's true for all of us. All right, a missional church. Again, if you have any questions on any of these slides, write them down, and we can go back to them. We can talk more about them. Um, there's a lot to say about each one. Missional church knows the times and cultures. Next one, a missional church is a contrast community of believers. Um, Kramer says, the more established and at home in this world the church feels, the more it is in danger of being the salt that has lost its savor. And we talked about this briefly last time with Israel. Um, 
the problem that they had in being a light, either A, they were exclusive, thinking we are the covenant people, God loves us, nothing out there, or they looked too much like the world around them that they weren't having any effect on them. Um, again, it has to be a contrast community. And what I mean is this is a place of justice in an unjust world. People should see that there's no favoritism here. Um, this is a community of generosity in a world of selfish consumerism. I mean, sometimes I think the church has bought too much into this idea of consumerism, trying to sell their own brand, almost like competing with other churches. It's like, oh yeah, you come to us, we got this. Ooh, we're the reform community and we're the evangelical community. But that's not what it's about. We're a community that cares only and exclusively for the world, not for ourselves. As a church, too. Not just as individuals. It's not about our church, it's about Christ and His glory. It's a generosity in a selfish, consumeristic world, a community of joy and thanksgiving in a hedonistic world that pursues pleasure. This is the cool thing about being a Christian, again. We are a community of joy and thanksgiving because we have everything received. Worked for nothing. That's the gospel. All right? And he's given us everything exactly that we needed and more. So when we go out, everybody out there is looking for joy. Everybody's looking for something that can fill them, and we have it. Do we show that? Just by being a thankful community in a country that, frankly, has, can become quite bitter sometimes. There's no reason to be bitter if you're a Christian. Community of sacrificial love in a self-centered individualistic age. Again, there's that contrast. Who are you living for? Christ has died for you so you can live for others and for him. A community of confessing sinners in a world of self-justification. This is a place, you know what? Anybody can confess anything here. And none of us would be surprised. That's what everybody wants. Trust me. Every single one of you want to confess sin. And wish that you could just confess it and hear the words you will forgive it. I want that. The church is a place for that. Um, I want to read a short quote from an early, um, from the early church. It's actually a little epistle from a guy called Mathetes which basically means just disciple. He was probably the disciple of the Apostle John. So this is, we're reading about a guy that was discipled by John. I can just imagine John, he probably had a beard like me, nice and gray and big, and sitting and teaching this disciple. And this disciple grows up and he writes a letter to a guy called Diogenes. Now Diogenes probably knew Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, okay? And it's kind of an apologetic for Christians. And he writes this, he writes about the Christians, they display to us their wonderfully and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share all things with others and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as the land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They beget children but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor they are glorified. Evil spoken of, yet they are justified. They revile and they bless. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened unto life. 
They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners and are persecuted by the Greeks, yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. To sum it all up in one word, he says, what the soul is in the body, that are Christians in the world. Do you hear that contrast? He's like, this is who we are, but they're doing this. Can Sing said, he said at the church today, that it stands out so powerfully. And we have a real opportunity for that. Especially in the way the world's going. It's becoming more consumeristic. Not less. It's becoming more selfish. It's becoming more individualistic. It's all about where you're going on vacation, what you're living for, what you're retiring for. Let's be the church. Share everything in common. So, a community of contrast believers. I think it's important. Then the next one we go back to, we're in the world, but not of it. And I think this one is important again. It's a hospitable community. Number five, hospitable community. I think most of you might know Isaiah 55, one and two, where God calls his people. Such a beautiful passage. He says, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Now, my mom always said, nothing is free. <laughs> because that's human nature, right? That's what we want to believe. I think that's why so many of us just struggle to really keep understanding and holding on to the gospel. We can't believe that God would still love us freely without merit. And he welcomes us home. And now the call to us is to show that overwhelming hospitality to the world. Again, Rosaria Butterfield has a beautiful line here where she says, let God use your home, your apartment, your dorm room, your front yard, community meet gymnasium, or a garden for the purpose of making strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family. Because that is the point. Building the church and living like a family, the family of God. Most of us in some way play politics. Um, everybody knows that if you're a politician, you need to hang out with the rich and famous, you need to make friends. And we all play that game, we give a little, take a little. Whether it's with our spouse, with our kids, with whoever. There's one person in this world that loved perfectly, self-sacrificially, and never ever played that game. That treated the president and the Caesar the same way as he would treat a prostitute. And he would welcome them in exactly the same way. He wouldn't bat an eye if the high priest walked through those doors. And get up and like, ooh, here's somebody I know. He would show hospitality to everyone he met. Open his house, open his doors. And I think we have such an opportunity. There are, especially for families. <laughs> Let me just say, I know families are crazy, insanely busy, but you have a meal every day. Invite somebody over. Even if it's just one meal a week, make that a missional meal. Like me and my wife, we try to have one day a week, which is a church day, where we only invite over church people, Sundays. So there's, anybody's always welcome at our house on Sundays from the church, from our church, we make that a church day. And then Wednesdays, we tr normally try to invite neighbors over for dinner. Anybody is welcome, co-workers, or if somebody from the church wants to have a place where they can just bring somebody for dinner, we have that. Use what God has given you and the places where he has put you to share the gospel. And be overly generous. Um, I, do, I do think, especially with how broken most lives are, if you invite somebody into your home and you just say grace before the meal, that's evangelism. <laughs> or they even see a place where not everybody is yelling at each other and cursing. That's evangelism. Or they see a place where there's like a dinner set on the table. 
that's evangelism. I encourage you guys to share at least one meal together. If you're living with anybody, um, whether it's a dorm or anything, set one meal where you guys sit around the table, pray, read. That's a great opportunity. Once you have that structure, to invite people into that structure and show the love of God. I love that Jesus loved food so much. He was always doing evangelism around food. I really do think meals is one of the most powerful times for evangelism. And that's what we found in our family. Um, people are really affected when they share a meal with family or with anybody. All right. Um, so, the shape of a missional church, it's um, mission, it, it's hospitable. And now we go back to where we started. I read Matthew 5. It's a community that is a light. Now, light is positive. Nobody likes to sit in the dark. And the question that I want to ask Emmanuel here, the question we need to ask ourselves, is hard questions. But those are the questions you can ask if your identity is not in your church but in Christ. You can look back at your own church and say, what is our reputation in the community? Can we look at our own church critically and, and what are people saying about our church? Um, is it good? Is it bad? Is it indifferent? It could be that's great. It could be indifferent. Maybe people just don't know there's a church here. It could be bad. It could be known as a certain exclusive club or community. Or it could be known as people that are judgmental. Now some of these accusations might be unfair. But we at least can confront them and say, you know what, my identity is not found in the goodness or the badness of my church. We know we have problems, but in Christ, and so we can address these in him. And we can continue to cause our light to shine brighter in the community. Um, witness in the community depends on how we walk during the week with Christ or against. Um, again, one of the ways, a great way to be a light in the community is also online. Um, anybody that's on Facebook or Instagram, I don't know if I should say I warn you or I encourage you. <laughs> the world is watching. The world is watching very closely. Every post, um, every picture, and uh, we can easily put forward something of Christianity that's Christianese. <laughs> And that's not really Christ-filled. And we're going to get a bit more to that a bit later. Also, the website. I read a recent survey that close to 100% of visitors visit a church through their website. Um, often, when we do street preaching, they'll go check the website um, and just see what the church is all about. Or if you do evangelism, it's great to have a website on there. Um, so, website is important. Again, these are very practical things. Um, that the church can make sure that they know of. Again, I want to read a quote from the early church. I love going back to the early church. Here again, the early church broke down barriers between rich and poor, male and slave, slave and free, Greek and barbarian, creating a profound sociologically, sociological impossibility. Without Christianity, the social structure of the church couldn't exist. Slaves and free in the same church. A slave being an elder while the free owner was sitting in the pew as a new believer? Boom! The world looked at this and was like, what? A potent gospel of love and charity was exercised through the poor, orphans, widows, sick, minors, prisoners, slaves, and travelers. And then he goes here at the end. Generosity with possessions and resources along with a simple lifestyle marked their lives in a world dominated by accumulation and consumption. Now what culture does that remind you of? For giving love toward each other and toward their enemies witnessed to the power of the gospel, the lives of the believing community nursed and shaped by the biblical story, which we heard about last week, enabled them to live as resident aliens, listen to this, as lights in a dark world. Are you part of the story? <clears throat> and are we continuing to present that light to the world? What's our reputation in the world? 
a community that's a light. Seven, the shape of a missional church is a community that has an effective theology of suffering. Now, I want to pause here. I'm going to do a couple slides here because I think this is an extremely important one, especially in the Christian culture we're living in today, filled with the prosperity gospel, filled with a Jesus that will fix all your problems. Um, <coughs> Winston Bosch, he's not famous. I just put his name up there because he was a close mentor of mine. Um, he did mission in Quebec for a long time. And uh, he says, we've been tricked. We have been deceived in believing in a Christianized version of the prosperity gospel where our comfort is supreme. It is not Christless. Now, he was using these words with an evangelical, but a very conservative church, a conservative church, a conservative evangelical church. And what he meant was the church spoke more about how much they needed a vacation and how their savings were doing or how tight things were without Christ. Now they, none of them would have ever bought into the prosperity gospel in a million years. But they were living that way in a sense. If I'm uncomfortable, if I'm suffering, I need to get that fixed. But if we don't have a developed theology of suffering in the church, we will not be able to identify with sufferers and walk alongside them the way Christ did. The second you show compassion, it means that you are going to suffer with that person. You understand that's what compassion means. To suffer with. Only the gospel gives us the tools to confront suffering and feel the depth of it while keeping the faith. Only the gospel. And there is intense pain out there. And there's intense pain in the church. And sometimes we just wash over it. We're afraid to go that deep. It scares us, and it should. But Jesus and God didn't stand from a distance and say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. I love you. How did his love look? He says, I'm going to enter into the death of your suffering. I'm going to take on your humanity. And I'm going to suffer like hell for sinners that deserve hell. I'm going to walk with you. That's what it means when he says with the Great Commission, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He is with us in our suffering, particularly. We need to get a developed theology of suffering. you really want, and this is from Keller, by the way he's suffering from pancreatic cancer, so if you're thinking about a developed theology of suffering, um, read something from him recently, it's, it's good stuff. If you really want to put the hands of the sufferer, suffering and the lost into the hands of our Savior, you need to stand close enough to get hurt. Are you willing to give your time, your money, and yourself for the sake of the gospel. Because we all know evangelism takes time. We all know it's not just a one-time track and the Holy Spirit crashes in and it can happen that way. And they're like repent and they, they repent and believe and they go to church as a full-grown church member for a lifetime. No. It takes an hour a week. It takes, you know what? Come back next week. Let's talk again. Come back next week. Hey, you want to start a Bible study? Can you set aside an hour or two a week? Are you even willing to do that? 
got to put our money where our mouth is. And the mouth proclaims the gospel. Let's let all of our life join in. And that's what a developed theology of suffering allows us to do. It allows us to enter into suffering and not be afraid. Trust me, nobody wants to suffer. I don't. But Jesus calls us to suffer. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And the cross is a vicious symbol. I mean, for Jesus to say that in the first century, they would be like, Whoa. pick up your sign of execution in the most bloody manner possible and follow me. But the reward is infinitely greater. Again, I want to give you one more quote before we move on. Um, it's again from my brother Keller, who goes before me. Christianity teaches that contra fatalism suffering is overwhelming. Beautiful, let's confess that. For any of you that are suffering here, I'm sure you experience that. Contra Buddhism, suffering is real. Contra karma, suffering is often unfair. Contra sec but contra secularism, suffering is meaningful. There's a purpose to it, and if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. That's with walking with God through pain and suffering. And this is the command of Jesus. Jesus suffered outside the camp, and then he invites us to go outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. Christians are to count it a privilege to follow the one who, for the joy set before him, endure the shame, despising its shame. Endure the cross, despising his shame for the joy set before him. So the church should be a church that especially identifies with the sufferers. Not with the self-righteous. Self-righteous people try not to suffer. They run away. But with the weak, the marginalized, the sinners. In the church, there should not be a celebrity. If it's a celebrity culture church, there's generally not going to be a lot of sufferers. Let's be real. Truly human. All right. I wanted to take two slides for that one. I think it's an absolutely important one, and I think it's one that the church often misses. And I think it's unbelievably powerful for evangelism. Like, I do a... Um, evangelism Bible study on Thursday nights and there's this guy that comes every week and we just started reading the book of John and now we're doing the book of Corinthians and he's like what? pastors are called to suffer? I'm like you're not richer than your church? I'm like no God doesn't want us to be rich. No. Ah, now I get it. I can truly just live my life in this way. I don't have to doubt my own faith. He was doubting his faith because people had been telling him, if you believe in Jesus, he will fix your problems. He will heal you. You'll have a great marriage. You're going to have a great relationship with your kids. Jesus doesn't serve us. We serve him. He believed in a sense through a work of the gospel, Jesus came to serve us. He did. But so that we could serve him. All right. Next one. The shape of a missional church is a community of believers who are willing to share their testimony. Um, I underlined, I highlighted, and I bolded there. Sometimes I do that in my sermon when I really need to emphasize a point. I'm not, I'm not just a, you know, a, a, a underliner. I, I do it all. Um, and why? Because I really want to make it personal for each one of you. We must be able to share not just the faith, but your faith. One of the buzzwords, again, if you know your culture today, is authenticity. And we hear all about all around us. People just want us to be real, to be authentic. Well, let's not fake it. 
I mean, you can't fake Holy Spirit, Apostle-like enthusiasm for Christ. So I think the question for each one of us and for the church is who is Jesus to us or for us? What difference has Jesus made in your life? That's the question. And, and this is a good thing just to meditate for yourself even. <laughs> to go home and, and grab a cup of coffee tomorrow morning. And it's supposed to be a little chilly, so make a fire. Sit in front of the fire and just pray and think for a moment. Wake up half an hour earlier. And say, I want to just write down some of the things that Jesus has truly changed in my life. I don't want to just give, keep on living this ordinary Christian life and think, you know what, yeah, Jesus does everything and he used these Christianese buzzwords, but I want to make it real for me. Has my Lord Jesus Christ, the living King of the universe, made a difference in my life by his Spirit? Is he with me to the end of the age? And how? And once you have that, you can share that. It's like, you're going to find other people like you. We humans are a lot alike, more alike than we like to believe. Or we can just be like, you know what? I dealt with that. And I'm still dealing with that. And you know what? Jesus is the answer. And he sees for me. And I know he will be for you. So it has to be a people that share their faith. Not just the faith, but their faith. In fact, your faith is the faith. There's a interlinking between the individual and the apostolic unity of the church from all ages and times. Um, and I think the Psalms is a great rubric. I mean, you read and underline how many times in the Psalms the word I is used. Personal confession is unbelievable. I mean, David is always having this personal nature of addressing others. And he's saying it publicly. He's saying, see what the Lord has done for me. And we can do that too. All right, the shape of missional church, nine, is a community with well-trained soldiers. Um, I think the church is not only a hospital for sinners, a training, but also a training ground for soldiers. I, I miss that old hymn, Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war With the cross of Jesus going on before um, you yeah, have a lot of those old militant hymns, and we are the church militant. Um, and I think it's important that we remember that and that we train disciples of Christ to be those soldiers that can go out into the world. The pastors and the elders must not carry the vision of the church alone. We are all evangelists. If you are a Christian, you are a light. It cannot be otherwise. And if you are not a light, you are not a Christian. That's as simple as that. Because Christ is bright. And his light will shine. Even though it may flicker sometimes. And he will not snuff it out. Yet that spark will always be there. So I encourage all of you to sign up. Um... I don't know if the church has a boot camp. I think a great boot camp to start is, I think there's a, a street evangelism taking place here, or mall evangelism, or whatever you do, taking place here weekly. Now, go. I mean, it's scary, but it's amazing. And just sit on the bench. You don't have to do anything. You can just sit and pray. As a soldier of Jesus Christ, say, Lord, this is not our work. I'm just going to sit here in the cafeteria of the mall and support them with my face being here, presence of Christ in this place. And I'm going to pray. Um, attend courses. Attend to the preaching of the word. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, to train you, to develop you, so that more and more we might know Christ and the power of his resurrection. So that we might share it with others. Um, again, the best kind of evangelism training, I'm a huge fan of this, is on the job training. Um, go with somebody that does it or has done it and just see what they do. 
again, you're going to have your own way because you have your own character, your own personality, and your own way of doing this. Um, so the question is just, are you being trained? And do you desire to be trained? Do you desire to grow in this? Do you desire to share Christ? Um, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Again, here the leaders must lead by example. If your elders and pastors are not at all interested in evangelism, generally you won't have a church that's too interested in evangelism either. Um, the more passionate a pastor becomes and elders become about evangelism, slowly it seeps down into the ranks, just like in any army. Um, it will seep down into the ranks if the leader is passionate. Um, ten, last one. And maybe you can have others. If you think of some others as like, wow, Pastor, I totally forgot about this one. I would love to hear from you. Ten is a community that is rooted in ancient traditions and relevant to contemporary years. Um, also here in South Africa, it's interesting. A recent survey says that churches that are growing the quickest sometimes can hold on to some kind of conservative theology. Um, now, that's especially true in the States. Um, and what I mean by... It's hard to use the label conservative. I really don't like using that label, but what I would say is ancient traditions rooted in the church, um, biblical traditions. Um, and I think some of these ancient traditions come through just in worship services, um, that there's a confession and absolution taking place, public reading of God's word, um, it takes place. Um, the preaching, the Christ-centered preaching, the response of the people. Um, so, on the one hand, the church must not let go of its Catholicity. And what I mean is that you and we and the church in South Africa is part of the universal church stretching back to the New Testament. And we can't pretend that we are not part of that history. We are profoundly a part of that story. <clears throat> and those traditions that have been built up in the church, like the preaching, come from the early church and are based out of the word. And we can't let go of that. On the other hand, we have to be relevant and contemporary to years today. Is the church welcoming? From car to pew, when people sit down, um, is there true hospitality taking place? Again, is the dress pleasing to God and not alienating to the unchurched? Again, we do everything for the sake of the gospel. Um, is worship followable? Now, in the tradition where I come from, we have a very structured way of worshiping, a very structured liturgy. And I love it. But that does mean it puts more onus on the one leading the service to explain what's happening. Saying, okay, this is, we're talking, we're having a conversation here with God, and this is what's happening when, for example, I read the law, or we sing, and then we respond, and then we preach, and then we respond with singing, and trying to allow even an unchurched member to be a part of that. Now, on the other hand, he should feel out of place, in a sense, in the church, if he's an unbeliever. It would be strange... For an unbeliever to be feel completely at home in the family of God. There should be an aspect of awkwardness. And anybody that's brought a complete unbeliever to church knows that feeling. Oh man, this is awkward. I hope they get this. But that's not important. They should feel sense awkward. They should have questions after church and be like, man, could you guys do that? If they didn't, it'd be even more strange. So that's what I mean, a community that's rooted in ancient traditions and relevant to contemporary years. Ho, oh, ha, I tricked you guys, I did put 11 on here. Okay, I got one more, but I did put it on here because I do think it's important. Um, Ariane, can we go to the next, oh, yes. And I didn't even number this one so that you guys think it's 10. <laughs> This is my, uh, my technology genius coming through. Sh the shape of a missional church is a praying um, community. Um, and we talked a bit about the flow of Acts last time. And I would love to, yeah, like we 
can you can walk through Acts sometime. And the flow of Acts is it's, it's prayer, the Holy Spirit, and preaching. And almost always in that order. It's a pleading for the Spirit of Christ to work. Now Jesus even commands his disciples, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send harvesters into the fields. And guess what? That prayer was answered with the people that he told to pray. Sometimes the prayer is answered by sending you, the one who's praying. That's what happens when you pray for things. I mean, if you give God an open door, you better watch out. He's going to go through. Um, Paul often, you'll hear him often at the end of his letters, and this is from Ephesians, pray also for me that words may be given to me so that I might preach more boldly. Open my mouth boldly in proclaiming the mystery of the gospel. And then he goes on, for which I am an ambassador in chains, so that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> and then the early church, they devoted themselves to prayer. And I have noticed in the four churches that I've been a part of, that I can usually gauge the church's missionary activity by looking at their prayer ministry. I think there's almost a direct connection. Because if we're passionate about communion with God, we're going to be passionate about prayer. If we have true communion with God, we're going to be filled with the Spirit. He's going to answer that prayer. I love what Jesus says in Luke. I mean, Matthew, he says, when, when a son asks you for a fish, how much more will he not give to those who ask him? And in Luke, he says, how much more will he not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He desires to fill you with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that you don't have a spirit. But there's a way in which we can pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. With the Spirit of the living Christ. And central, vital, to evangelism, to this church growing, is prayer. Is a people on their knees. Asking God, God, I'm afraid. I'm broken. And I have doubts. I don't even know if I can do this, but Lord, send people into the harvest. And if it is not me, let me be praying for them. It's not everybody's going to be out there on the streets, but everybody's going to desire it. If you desire something, you're going to want to be involved in something. Somewhere. And then, when it does happen, it doesn't add to the pride of the church. Oh, look how big our church is. Our church is bigger than your church. Dandy, dandy, dandy. It's never going to happen. Never. We're going to be even more emotional, more broken, and say, Lord, we don't deserve this, but thank you. This is you that's doing the work. How much more will we not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So just a quick recap, the missional church community is one, has apostle-like, Holy Spirit-filled enthusiasm for Christ. Two, loves the work. Three, understands culture and times. Four, a contrast community. Five, a hospitable community. Six, a light available. Seven, has a healthy theology of suffering. Eight, shares their testimony. Nine, well-trained soldiers. Ten, grounded in ancient traditions while being contemporary. Eleven, tricky one, a praying community. And I want to leave you with this prayer from one of the saints that started the conversion in Ireland. You know him as St. Patrick. Um, maybe the green and the shamrock. But he was a missionary. And this is his prayer. This is my prayer. I rise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me. From snares of the devil, from temptations of vices, and every one who desires me ill, afar and near, alone or in a multitude, Christ shield me today 
against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding. wounding. Oh man, I didn't print the whole prayer. Against wounding. But he ends with these words. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ beside me. Christ on the left. Christ on the right. Christ above me. Christ beneath me. That's the gospel. We go with him in his power and in his strength. We're not in this alone. Amen. Thank you guys. Any questions?